Yes, no. Close enough. We all remember everything we talked about last time. And what does that mean? He's about to ask us a clicker question. Um, so, <clears throat> clicker question number one for today. Why is it unlikely that the largest virions have helical caps in symmetry? Because they have identical subunit interactions, must have multiple different caps of proteins, only package RNA, only package SSDNA, that's single-stranded DNA, or they would be extremely long. Yes, gut first, then think about it. That's a very good idea as far as these are concerned. Hey, you got 10. If you haven't voted yet, vote quickly. Okay, we've got um, basically half and half as far as people, what they think the answer should be. Here we are. Um, <clears throat> so the, okay, identical subunit, subunit interactions, um, helical caps and symmetry do have identical caps and subunit interactions uh, because they must have multiple different caps of proteins in the package RNA, only package single kind of DNA. Nobody likes the RNA or DNA, which is good. Um, so we're down to B or E, and basically multiple different caps of proteins, or they'd be extremely long. How large are the largest genomes? We've talked really briefly about that, but there are hundreds of thousands of nucleotides in length. What would that do if you have a helical capsid? It'd be really, 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 really insanely long. Um, and is there any particular reason they must? Anytime Stedman puts must in something, <laughs> is usually um, kind of a giveaway. So no, um, not must. So the the correct answer here is E, because they would be extremely long. Okay. Uh, questions on that um, part of structures, etc. No, yes, too early in the morning, yes. too early in the morning, okay, got it. Um, so just really quickly in terms of review, uh, last time, these are kind of the other things that we didn't talk about yet, so with our extra, this time with our extra clear question, um, pseudosymmetry, the whole idea of pseudosymmetry is actually that B, which some of you probably thought, is that you have multiple different capsid proteins which are interacting with each other. So a pseudo T equals three means that you've got multiple different capsid proteins interacting with each other in a otherwise quasi-equivalent structure. And I did bring my extra models with me today. Um, another one of the important things we talked about last time was the idea of cross-linking. When I say cross-linking, I mean the peptide bonds that can form between side chains of capsid proteins. It's really important for HK97 and probably important for a lot of the other bacteriophage capsids. We actually don't know for many of them whether that's the case or not, but that you have these extra peptide bonds that form and make some of these capsids uh, extremely stable. Helical symmetry, again, we just talked about, um, and then a little bit about envelopes and budding, the whole process whereby you can get these enveloped viruses. And today we'll talk a lot more about entry, so what happens with these enveloped viruses and how they then get back inside a particular cell. So any questions on the structural stuff that we talked about last time? Everyone's happy with a quasihedral symmetry. Yes, Trevor. Okay. Okay. 
you're probably not the only one who has that question. So I um, <clears throat> wanted today just really finish up a little bit with how taxonomy has become really confusing. Um, I mentioned last time that it's not really very good. The ICTV, how you come up with species versus genera. And of course, I forgot to bring my book with me, um, but I'll bring it next time if I remember. Uh, but I wanted to talk about some of the ideas that, in fact, have some of which have come out of uh, the study of this virus that I discovered in terms of thinking about what people talk about really deep phylogeny or deep taxonomy. And that's how basically all viruses are potentially related to each other or whole big classes of viruses are related to each other. And that has to do with the actual structure of the capsid proteins and how they fit together. Um, we'll do a brief overview of the various different virus types. This is kind of a review for everything that's going to come after this in the rest of the course. Um, and then most of today we'll talk about virus entry and a little bit about virus exit. And this is a very broad overview. It's a nice kind of review again for all of the different viruses we'll be talking about for the rest of the course. And then if we get there, we'll talk about bacteriophage and particularly single-stranded RNA bacteriophage, which are some of the simplest viruses out there with the possible exception of some of the ones that my graduate students will be talking about later on in the course. So today, again, some quick key concepts. Structural similarity may be a way to address some really deep phylogeny, how viruses that are infecting extremely different hosts might actually be related to each other. Um, fusion, then that's really particularly for enveloped viruses, but also for the non-enveloped viruses, how they get inside cells. It all has to do with, with fusions of membranes and how you go about fusing membranes together. Most of that has to do with conformational change, and that's going to be the viral receptor binding proteins that undergo conformational change. There's some really, I think, great videos looking at animations, of course, of how people think these things are taking place. But it's really impressive what's going on with some of those things. And then um, as far as many, many viruses, particularly if you think about viruses that have DNA genomes infecting eukaryotic cells, all of the DNA replication machinery is where in a eukaryotic cell? In the nucleus. So your virus genome getting released in the cytoplasm isn't good enough. You actually got to get it to the nucleus as well. So a lot of virus entry also has to do with getting the genome to the place where it needs to be in order to be replicated. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that again when we talk about virus entry. But first I wanted to talk about my second favorite virus, or, you know, virus and virion, although we know actually very little about the life cycle of how it replicates, other than this absolutely gorgeous virion, which has a T equals 31, I'm not going to expect you to remember that <laughs> um, Structure. <clears throat> and, but again, the, the whole point of this is that we're talking about where all of the hexamers are, which can be a little hard to see on here. But each of these little guys are your hexamers. And then the pentamers are really blatantly obvious on here, which is one of the sort of really beautiful aspects of this particular virion. So um, I was working on this again. I discovered this virus when I was looking for our little lemon-shaped viruses and microscope in a moment during my postdoc in Bozeman, Montana, which reminds me, um, next week, uh, the guy I was sort of mentoring as a PhD student is now giving the NIH New Investigator seminar for undergraduate students talking about CRISPRs, and that's what he does now. Um, so I'll post that link. It should be a really good seminar. Um, Blake, we can have some guys working with some time. But it's kind of an aside. Um, but basically, we had discovered this new virus um, it's great, it's got the psychosedral symmetry, so it's really easy, more or less, um, to put in the cryo-electron microscope, do a bunch of averaging, get this beautiful structure. And this is all done by Jack Johnson of the Scripps Research Institute with his postdoc, Liang Tang. Um, but what they noticed was not just that you've got these really amazing structures of the five-fold axis of symmetry, but more importantly, that the hexons, or this is the <clears throat> what's making up those hexameric structures, have this really interesting double beta barrel structure or double jelly roll structure. And they, a little bit later on, found that this is that structure from our virus. This is infecting archaea, 
But what they noticed really early on is that the structure of a <coughs> capsid protein from bacteria, this is from the bacteriophage PRD1, and this is from the animal virus, adenovirus, these structures, sort of shown here in green and red, are extremely similar to each other, and they're also really quite similar to this blue structure. And what that means is you have viruses infecting bacteria, archaea, and eukarya that have practically identical structures of their major capsid proteins. There's no detectable sequence similarity between any of these things. So what do we think this means? Um, it could have been horizontal gene transfer, um, but that would have been horizontal gene transfer between bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, which is <laughs> incredibly <laughs> unlikely. And even if that had happened, all the regulatory systems between bacteria, archaea, and eukarya are very different. So we think that's an unlikely scenario. Convergent evolution is certainly possible. That well, We already talked about how an icosahedron or icosahedron symmetric particles is a great way for packaging nucleic acid. So maybe this double beta barrel structure is a really good way of doing that. Uh, and so that's certainly possible, but if that's the case, then we've clearly had large amounts of convergent evolution and then changes in the sequence in such a way to give you very, very different structures. Now, what we think this means is it's evidence for a common ancestor of viruses which are infecting all of these sorts, to say members of all of the domains of cellular life as we know it. Um, so we published this a couple of years ago. Actually, we uh, more than 10 years ago, frightening. Uh, we actually tried to get it published in Nature and Science, and they didn't like it. And then, of course, uh, Nature then came back and published this you know, nice little review <laughs> article saying, oh, isn't this cool? And they published it in PNAS because you rejected our paper. <laughs> <laughs> so um, also, um, the structure was done then soon thereafter. So basically, what we think this means is that there was a common ancestral virion that, of course, looked exactly like the one that I discovered. No. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, that had a capsid protein that actually looked really similar um, between all of these different groups. And it's not just me who's this crazy and thinks about this. There are other people as well, um, particularly Dennis Bamford, who's done, done a really nice study of these particular now major capsid proteins from viruses that infect all kinds kinds of different organisms. So um, up at the top here, again, we've got adenovirus. Um, then we've got a couple of viruses that infect bacteria, um, PM2 and PRD1. So here, PRD1 and PM2. These are bacterial infecting viruses. STIV, this is the one that I discovered. All have very similar double beta barrel structures, very similar to the structure of major capsid protein of a virus that infects algae, um, these adenoviruses that are infecting humans and then you know, semi-humans here as well. Um, but even some of the viruses that I mentioned really briefly, viruses that infect other viruses, so they're called the virophage or the Sputnik, which we'll talk a lot more about when we talk about the megaviruses towards the end of the course, also have these structures. So it certainly looks, you know, the most parsimonious way of talking about, thinking about this, I should say, is that some ancestral virus had this kind of fold. And so one of the things that particularly Dennis Bamford, and that's his group here, have been looking into is, completely theoretically, of course, thinking about how viruses are related based on their structures, not so much based on their sequences. And so they've come up with about seven or eight different major groups of viruses. I'm not going to call them phyla or kingdom or anything else like that, just groups. Uh, viruses that all seem to be related by the structures of their capsid proteins. Uh, and so I think this is a really useful tool to think about how some of these viruses may have arisen and also thinking about origins of viruses. Your question, I think, in sort of lecture number one, you know, where did viruses come from if they were all dependent on cells in the first place? Uh, so probably some of these kinds of structures were around at, at that particular point in time. Yeah, David. So no discernible common sequence. So the sequences have just mutated like crazy and kept the same similar structure and 
Yeah, so the, basically the question is, you know, are these they're basically undetectable sequence and it must have mutated for a really long time. I'm just backing up a slide here. Um, basically, the consensus is that this common ancestor was anywhere between 3 and 4 billion years ago, which is plenty of time for you to get sequence divergence. Uh, but clearly at the same time, you have to have some kind of selection to keep that structure. So the sequence will have changed a lot, but the structure has to be maintained. And so if you think about it from an evolutionary point of view, um, it would make sense that you keep the structure. You may be able to you know, modify the sequence as a whole bunch. Yeah? Well, so, so the question is, you know, what about the selection pressure? Basically, it's what I've thought about before. It's geometry. Okay. <laughs> you know, how do you package a really inefficient genetic material like nucleic acids? You want to make something that's similar to a sphere. You make it as an icosahedra. How do you make icosahedral subunits? One of the ways to do that, it's only one of the ways, is to have these double beta barrel structures. So this is true only for the iconsohedrally symmetrical viruses. The, there's, interesting enough, a lot fewer filamentous ones or helical. You know, there are different ways of looking at it. And probably because of this um, size limitation that I mentioned in the clicker question right at the beginning. OK, so <clears throat> let's uh, skip past Dennis's stuff. <clears throat> Wanted to do really, really, really brief overview, and that's actually mostly because it's in the textbook, and I wanted to cover it really briefly. Maybe next time I'm going to drop these out completely. But again, this is just really broad brush overview introduction for the rest of the course. Um, DNA viruses, these are from the very largest genomes. <clears throat> and in fact, this slide is out of date. Um, there are actually some that are 5 million base pairs in size. Um, the Pandora viruses are, in fact, the largest ones. Um, and also have the very smallest genomes. Some of the single-stranded DNA viruses have genomes that are smaller than 2,000 bases. Um, and this is not, not base pairs. Um, so these single-stranded DNA viruses, again, these are the ones that are packaging just a single-stranded DNA, have to go through double-stranded DNA in order to replicate. Uh, my graduate student in education will be giving our guest lecture on some of these. Uh, these have relatively small sizes, again, from 2 kb. Um, interestingly enough, just about a, two years ago, um, one of my colleagues isolated one that's 22,000 bases in an archaeal single-stranded DNA virus genome. Uh, this is probably because, just like all nucleic acid, it's still pretty inefficient. And the reason here is that probably they're relatively small. You can have a very small capsid um, and then still package your genome this way. But you find them infecting all kinds of different organisms, bacteria, archaea, um, plants, animals, sort of you name it. They're some of the most successful, as far as we can say, certainly in terms of numbers of virions that are out there. On the flip side, at the other most successful are the double-stranded DNA viruses. And it sort of makes sense why this would be, because you, know, you just need that one step to make your messenger RNA. It's all cellular, because you've got cellular DNA-dependent RNA polymerases. Um, and these guys are humongous, and again, this should actually be greater than 2.5 megabase pairs, and megabases is a million base pairs in size. So these have the largest genomes. Um, in fact, there was just another publication that came out, I think about a month and a half ago, um, looking at some of these um, megavirus genomes and how they may even have these virus defense systems against the viruses that infect them, that Sputnik virus that I just talked about before. So again, very broad brush. Which um, Baltimore classes are these? They're one and two. Um, RNA viruses, the other kinds of Baltimore classes. Again, we've got positive and negative strand, as well as the double-stranded RNA viruses. Um, again, very much an overview here. Interestingly enough, these positive-strand RNA viruses have the largest genomes, but this is minuscule relative to the largest double-stranded DNA virus genomes, up to about 31,000 bases in terms of their length. Um, and people think that may have to do with replication. We'll talk much more about these when we talk about the coronaviruses later on, because these are the ones that have the largest positive-strand, single-stranded genomes. Um, so you've got some that are big, some that are small, some have envelopes, some don't have envelopes. Um, Negative-strand RNA viruses, these guys get a, a pretty bad rap for 
some pretty obvious reasons. Um, Ebola is one of the examples of these negative strand RNA viruses. Um, what's everyone else's favorite negative single strand RNA virus? Marburg. That we've all, well, Marburg, but <laughs> kills a multiple orders of magnitude more people per year than Ebola ever has. Malaria? No. Malaria is not a virus. <laughs> no. <laughs> everyone get their flu, flu shots? Yeah. Um, flu spreads really well to about a meter away from people, so look around, see how close the seats are relative to each other. Just to let you know about that. So yeah, we'll talk a lot more about flu as we move along. Yeah? How hard is it to package um, the, vi the viral dependent proteins? Like, do the enzyme need any, do they take up a lot of space or are they nothing? So the, the question here is basically, how hard is it to package the enzymes that you need to replicate these, and you're exactly right, to these negative strand RNA genomes because you've got to make the messenger RNA from that. So you have to bring the protein with you before you can make proteins. Proteins relative to DNA and for RNA for that matter are really small. And so the actual amounts are pretty minuscule in terms of actual amount of that you have to be able to package. However, you're thinking about helical packaging and the proteins packed along a helix, something like TMV, which is this nice, you know, just all it is is capsid proteins and RNA, um, there there's not going to be any space to add one of these things. And we'll look at the packaging for, <clears throat> excuse me, influenza um, later on, really fascinating modifications sort of on this theme. Um, one of the things that allows you to get away with this um, packaging issue is to instead of having a single molecule, you actually package multiple molecules. And I actually think to think of these as sort of like chromosomes of the individual viruses. Um, and that's actually true also for, excuse me, true for influenza. There are multiple different segments, which people call them in, in virology. I just think of them again as chromosomes. So many of these um, are segmented, and that's a way you can have, just like what we do with our chromosomes. You know, if it was one chromosome, it would be two meters long. But if we split it up into 44, they can actually be a lot shorter. So basically exactly the same idea. Um, there are a number of double-stranded RNA viruses that unfortunately we're not going to have much of a chance to talk about this term because terms are only 10 weeks, and I try and talk fast, but I can't talk quite that fast. Um, but these guys very often also have these segmented genomes, so multiple kinds of chromosomes, and um, mostly icosahedral capsids um, that go together. Reverse transcriptase virus, oh, sorry. Just, we might get into it later, but mm -hmm. I was thinking, like, these have to be incredibly fragile. Uh, oh, the individual virions or the individual? <laughs> yeah, just a you know, naked piece of RNA that big. So, yeah, so the, the question is here is aren't some of these things really unstable? And the answer is the, these nucleic acids are always complex with proteins. And so there's always going to be something associated with them. Actually, not unlike our DNA. <laughs> um, there's always something which is associated, always <laughs> proteins that are associated with it. Yeah? So those are going to yeah, we'll talk a lot more about what those things are doing when we get to the individual. Um, it, it's kind of hard to make broad brush things at this point because many of the viruses are different. Okay, and I just wanted to really briefly cover the reverse transcriptase viruses. I'm not going to call these retroviruses, and I'm not going to call them a particular Baltimore class because this is where it gets fishy in terms of all of the... <clears throat> Descriptions thereof, the classic, you know, Baltimore class six, because David Baltimore was one of the co-discoverers of these. The retroviruses have an RNA packaged in their virion. That RNA gets reverse transcribed into DNA, etc. But there are a number of actually very closely related viruses that package very different nucleic acid. They still all depend on this reverse transcription step, but they just package different intermediates in that whole process. So the HEPA DNA viruses, um, in fact, package partially double-stranded DNA with a little bit of RNA on it. And so this is that exception which I talked about is that capsids only package DNA or RNA. Um, the HEPA DNA viruses, hepatitis B is the best studied of these, um, in fact, package both RNA and DNA. Um, and it's the RNA, it's actually an RNA primer that's left over from replication that's still packaged as part of that. Um, there are also the colimoviruses. These are some plant viruses. Um, the plant 
virus community, again, getting back to taxonomy, um, they name all of their viruses based on what they infect. So Kali is cauliflower, and Mo is mosaic, which is the particular phenotype you get when cauliflower is infected by this particular virus. Um, and we'll get to some more of those later on. But basically, this is the exact opposite, as it were, of the RNA, which is packaged in the retroviruses. This is the double-stranded DNA, which is packaged in the virion, but still has an obligate reverse transcription step in terms of how these are being <coughs> replicated. So um, we'll talk much more about retroviruses, a little bit about the hepatina viruses, and then some about plant viruses, but not the Kalimo viruses. Um, there are also non-viruses, um, and these are the so-called defective viruses. Um, the satellite viruses, a satellite virus is a virus which can only infect a cell that's already infected by another virus. Um, and since there are well, many cells that are already infected by viruses, it's actually not that uncommon. You do see quite a few of these. Um, we'll talk more about these later on. I would call this a true virus because it still goes through that full virus life cycle, extracellular infects, etc. It's just that the host has to have another virus that's associated with it. Um, these guys, the viroids, I would actually not call real viruses. And the reason for that is they have no capsids. They never actually get outside of the cell in a encapsidated form. But they're still infectious. So they're actually little small RNAs, some of them just a little over 100 nucleotides in length, that are infectious and cause disease. Really wild and crazy, mostly found in plants. And we may talk a little bit more about them when we talk about the plant viruses later on. Yeah, Trevor. Um, are the satellite viruses, when they interact with their helper viruses, is it a, like a symbiotic relationship or a parasitic relationship? Or in the... <laughs> um, I would say yes. <laughs> Good answer. Yeah. Um, someone's been listening to my lectures already. Uh, but yeah, it varies. It really is going to vary depending on which um, kind of relationship. Most of the time when we're going to talk about satellite viruses, they're going to be much more of a symbiotic kind of relationship. However, when we talk about the virophage, which some people will think about as also sort of a satellite virus, that's clearly something which is parasitic on the larger virus, which is there. So you've got a, a range of different things there. Okay, so a little break, take a breather, and pull out your clickers. Um, breather as the case may be. Um, so <clears throat> viruses with the largest genomes known to date are double-stranded DNA viruses, single-stranded DNA viruses, single-stranded RNA viruses, positive, single-stranded negative, or retrovirus. Again, please feel free to talk about this. <laughs> Just like Wisconsin, vote early, vote often. <laughs> That's more Chicago. Awesome. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. A few more to come in. Ten. Five. Ah, oh, not quite 100%, um, but close. Fortunately, I agree with you, or most of you anyway. So, <clears throat> okay, so yes, the, um, the largest ones are in fact those um, with double-stranded DNA genomes. These are the megaviruses, the mimiviruses, the Pandora viruses, um, the pitho viruses, um, etc. So switch gears a little bit, talk about 
entry. Um, this is getting that virion inside the cell, and not so much the virion, but the genome, which is inside the bag, the virion, to the place that it needs to be. How does it have to happen? It's receptors. Those are cellular macromolecules on the outside of the cell that the virus is going to interact with. And again, incredibly creatively, all the virions have receptor binding proteins. So the receptors, the cellular macromolecule, and the protein in the virus is then the receptor binding protein. Um, very often, there'll be some kind of membrane fusion event that takes place here, even for some of the naked or unenveloped viruses. Um, once you have your you know, incorporated, and very often what will happen is that you'll have um, endocytosis, which takes place, then you actually have an enveloped virus inside an endosome. So you have to have fusion. And then also, if you have a capsid, um, particularly true if you've got a naked virus, but in many of the enveloped viruses, you have a capsid inside the envelope. That needs to be dissociated. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning, very often the genome needs to be replicated in the nucleus. So you need to get the genome somewhere else as well. And then we'll talk a little bit some of the antiviral drugs which are being used to look at this. I did want to look at this um, nice little basic animation here, um, which hopefully we can get to come up. This is... <clears throat> from uh, another textbook that we're not using, but basically looking here at the Instance infection by process. Which enveloped viruses enter host oh, cells. In one of the mechanisms, the virion. So we don't need the uh, actual audio for this, but here we have an enveloped virus, which is binding to this receptor, and then fusion that happens at the plasma membrane, the virion, Capsid is released and then you know, magically disappears and you have your genome here. Uh, that's one process. Probably the most common process with these enveloped viruses is that you have receptor-mediated endocytosis. This is what most cells do anyway. And basically form this endosome. And inside the cell, this endosome then fuses with the virus envelope. And then the capsid is released. Magic happens. And you have the release of your genome here. The final process here is where you have a naked virus that also very often gets taken up by receptor mediated endocytosis. But now you can't have membrane fusion that takes place. Somehow the membrane needs to be broken. Again, magic, it dissolves. Um, and then our genome is released here. So this is a very much an overview process. We'll look at the individual viruses in some more detail a bit later on. But I like this as a, a basic overview. Have something to stabilize that endosome. This, like, as soon as that comes apart, the cell knows what's up. <laughs> yeah. So the um, stabilization of endosomes, uh, generally not particularly. Um, there doesn't seem to be a way. Though what happens is in endosomes, you have a change in pH, sort of on its way to the lysosome. And so, those of you who haven't had cell biology, this would be a good place to go back and look at some of these things. So um, when you form an endosome, it's going to have neutral pH because of the, it's the neutral pH in the outside of the cell. That pH goes down inside the endosome. And usually that lowering of pH is the signal that these viruses have evolved to recognize, again, to totally over-anthropomorphize, uh, and then cause this membrane fusion event to take place. And the best understood of these is the influenza receptor binding protein, um, also known as hemagglutinin. And so this is uh, just an image of that particular um, protein here. This is as it's produced inside the cell. Once it gets released from the cell, there's a proteolysis event. And we'll talk more about proteolysis later on. This is one of the ways that when you have assembly inside the cell, it's not going to be infectious. It's only going to get infectious once you get outside the cell. One of the ways that happens is through <laughs> proteolysis. But the important thing here, as far as entry is concerned, at a low pH, there's a big conformational change that happens in this red part of the protein. And basically what happens is this bit down here becomes a alpha helix sitting up here. So it's a response to the low pH environment, which is basically telling the virus that it's in an endosome 
and that endosome is getting inside the cell because it's becoming more acidic. And so very often that's how a lot of these things are detecting this process. So now I'd like to look at another couple of examples of this. Um, first looking at how HIV does its fusion event. HIV is also an enveloped virion um, and how that comes inside the cell. You know, missing plug-in. Don't tell me this is a... The, uh, our friends at OIT updated my computer overnight and then obviously got rid of the plug-in in the process. Okay, so um, I'll post this. The, the link is there so you can guys take a look at it. But basically, it's the same message <clears throat> that we talked about before, um, and that is that we have a conformational change that takes place. Uh, the, basically, this very similar process is going on with dengue. Um, dengue is a flavivirus, um, also closely related to the virus du jour, which is Zika. Zika. Um, and in fact, um, dengue kills way, way more people than Zika probably ever will. Um, but people are always freaked out about the new nasty ones. Uh, but it's really well known, in fact, how dengue and probably actually Zika undergoes the membrane fusion, which takes place here. And just to give a bit of an overview of this video, which we can, I suppose we can try, but I'm 90% sure it's not going to work. Thanks to our friends at OIT. Let's see. Oh, oh actually, this one is going to work. Cool. Good. Okay, except we want to kill the audio on here because it's uh, not very useful. Yeah. And Flash is the other one. So, uh, but there, I think I've got a link there as well. But, uh, but basically, what we're looking at here, and this is all about you know, why it's important to study dengue, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the important thing, as far as we're concerned, is that's what the virion looks like. Um, it comes inside the cell, again, uh, through this receptor mediated in the cytosis, gets transported along <clears throat> filaments inside the cell. But now what happens is the pH changes. See, that's the, the, the glittery stuff in the background. That's the change in pH. And what happens is you have a complete rearrangement that takes place of those glycoproteins on the outside. They go from dimers to trimers. And this trimeric form now has undergone this conformational change. Then a second conformational change happens to basically pull the membrane of the cells, the endosome membrane at the top, and the membrane of the envelope down here at the bottom of the virion um, together. And this is all um, based on data. We don't know, we have that kind of resolution here. Um, and now here's our RNA genome with the proteins attached to it. And this gives you a, a bit of an idea. In fact, the proteins are too big relative to the nucleic acid um, in this particular structure. And so that's the process on how this membrane fusion takes place. The HIV one is actually very similar, and, you know, uh, but the, the thing it talks about there is in fact one of the new drugs that people are trying to develop to actually stop this conformational change that has to happen in order to get the membrane fusion to take place. Yeah? That second conformational change, is that just happening at one spot or all over the cell? Or all, over the all over the virion? Yeah. And so basically you're forming multiple pores, or are you forming just one? That's a really fabulous question, and nobody has a good answer to that because we don't have the appropriate resolution to look at some of these things. There's new developments in optical microscopy, which hopefully are going to allow us to answer that question. Um, but the size that we're talking about here, particularly for something like dengue or <clears throat> any of the other flaviviruses, are about tens of nanometers across. And so identifying subsets on those tens of nanometers is really, really difficult. Um, and showing that they're actually, in fact, functional. Yeah? Is the second confirmational change that, that triple thing, um, is that also in the pH-mediated? So the, the question here is whether uh, which of those conformational changes is pH-mediated and which one's not. In the case of dengue, I think and this is my think, I'm not absolutely certain on this. I think that first conformational change has to do with interaction with the receptors, and so actually coming inside the cell, and it's the second one, which is a pH-based one. Um, that I, I'm not absolutely certain about. I do know for influenza that that 
basically the second conformational change is really pH dependent. But the, the whole fusion event, how these two membranes come together, is still a very open and active area of research. We don't completely understand that very well. And that's actually shown a little bit better in the, the HIV video that has Flash that was installed on this computer and got uninstalled. So, <clears throat> um, so those are how we're getting the release of the genome. Once we have the <clears throat> genome being released, then it really depends on what kind of a virus we're talking about here. If we're talking about something like these flaviviruses, they're positive strand unimolecular genomes, those can be translated immediately. And so as soon as that genome is released, it can start to be translated. Um, if, however, we're thinking about things like adenovirus, any of these double-stranded DNA viruses, those have to get their genome to the nucleus. So there are going to be lots of different things that are happening here, and um, many of them are actually using just cellular machinery to get that virion or that virus nucleic acid to the nucleus. And so the example for the dengue actually has them moving along microtubules, and those microtubules are regular cellular cytoskeleton thing. Uh, Sometimes you're going to have replication again on the cytoplasm. Again, this is pretty much always going to be for your positive strand RNA viruses, which can replicate um, right there. Um, where these things happen, again, you know, depends on your various different viruses. Um, we looked at this already in the animation at the beginning. Can be at the cell membrane. This is relatively rare. Most of the time, it's going to be through some kind of endosome process. And again, that kind of makes sense. You know, most cells pick up things from the environment through these endosomal processes. So receptor-mediated endocytosis seems to be sort of the most common mechanism, at least for animal viruses, that you're getting these viruses coming inside the cell. Um, this all has to happen before you get to the nuclear membrane with the vast majority of viruses, although there are very few that actually have their genome finally released inside the nucleus. But getting inside the nucleus also means you've got to get across yet another membrane or through the nuclear pore complex. And um, we'll talk about that. turns out that some of the retroviruses are really interesting that way. Um, they can actually only get inside the nucleus when you have cell division that takes place. So that, that nuclear membrane is actually so good at protecting the nucleus that the only way these viruses can get in um, at all is that way. Why the nucleus? Um, yeah, that's because that's where all the machinery is that you need to replicate your genome. And that's what you know, the virus needs to do is replicate their genome. So um, DNA synthesis, cellular DNA synthesis is all going to be happening inside the nucleus. And also, if you think about it from the point of view of RNA, so in theory, an RNA virus, positive strand RNA virus, should be able to translate everything it needs out in the cytoplasm, but so should be completely turned down. So mute, AB mute. Oh, that kills that one too. Say technology, gotta love it. Is that better? No, it's still talking. Yeah, it's YouTube, which is still going. Dengue fever. Woohoo! Let's just stop this. I don't think we need this anymore. Thank you. Isolation wards, great excitement. Um, we'll look at some really nasty stuff when we talk about Ebola, don't worry. There's some, plenty of that good stuff later on. Um, yeah, so uh, even if you think about an RNA virus genome, um, which is replicating, it still needs all of the <clears throat> ribonucleotides. Where are the ribonucleotide triphosphates? They're mostly in the nucleus, because that's where transcription is going to be taking place as well. All the RNA synthesis that takes place inside the cell is going to be taking place for the vast majority um, in the nucleus. So getting to the nucleus really makes um, a lot of sense. So how do you get into the nucleus? Um, I mentioned this already. Um, the easiest way to get into the nucleus is just wait for it not to be there anymore. <laughs> um, and this is what happens with some of these retroviruses, particularly like HIV. So um, they actually have to have membrane dissociation, happens in mitosis. And so they just wait around until mitosis happens. Then they can get um, inside there. Um, number of viruses also use 
the regular import machinery. Um, and actually, I'm mistaken here. This is good that I write my notes. Um, HIV-1 <coughs> is one of those viruses, excuse me, um, which actually uses these important structures. Um, so the lentiviruses, um, and lentivirus, uh, what do you think lentivirus means? Slow. So actually, uh, some of these, including HIV, are known as the slow viruses as opposed to some of these other retroviruses. So these actually have cellular machinery. And again, hopefully this is more of cell biology again. Um, importins and exportins. These are proteins that bind to specific either nucleotide sequences or other proteins, move them back and forth across the nuclear membrane. Um, so this is what happens in the case of HIV. So I was mistaken here. It's most retroviruses wait for mitosis, but these guys actually can get in even the absence of mitosis. Uh, a number of cases, you actually have the whole capsid that's moved to the nuclear membrane and then will dissociate at the nuclear membrane. This is true for adenoviruses and herpes viruses. And then for some of the really small ones, um, hepatitis B, and when I say small, I mean the actual capsid is small, SV40. Uh, these can actually get in through the pore complex. They're small enough you can actually see access through the pore complex. So as an overview here, um, this is a great review slide, and I'll be using it many, many times for many, many different viruses. This is looking at lots of different ways that you can get inside the cell and then also get inside the nucleus. So here, HIV fuses at the plasma membrane, but needs to get into the nucleus. It's a core structure, and that's in my little model that I have here of our HIV genome. The envelope here on the outside will fuse. Then you have a capsid that's released. Then the nuclear capsid comes out of that. That gets transported to the nucleus. Influenza comes in through these endosome-mediated processes, receptor-mediated endocytosis. Change in pH causes a change in the structure. Um, turns out there are multiple changes in pH here. There's a change in pH on the outside and a change in pH on the inside of the virion. Um, that releases the genome. This now also gets transported into the nucleus and replicating, even though this is a negative strand RNA virus, it still is replicating in the nucleus, and we'll see why that is when we talk about that a little bit later on. Adenovirus, which actually was that last example in the first video that we looked at, the first animation. Naked virus comes in through receptor-mediated endocytosis. The capsid itself actually gets outside of the endosome. There's a really nice um, BBC uh, video about talking about the the battle inside the cell. Um, really amazing animation. Um, I'll put a link to that. It's about half an hour, so too long for this class. Uh, but then once that capsid is transported to the nuclear membrane, that's where it dissociates and the DNA is released. Very similar things happen with herpes virus, only herpes viruses are enveloped viruses. Um, but again, the capsid gets transported to the nucleus and is released there. These small viruses like hepatitis B or SV40, the whole capsid gets transported into the nucleus. And then the tiniest viruses, which we'll talk about um, later on, uh, these also come in, but it's a slightly different process. Um, it's a recycling endosome rather than your endosome, a receptor media endocytosis, and getting everything inside the cell. So. Lots of processes, but mostly mediated through these endosome processes. Yeah? Do any uh, virions affected uh, ATP inside of the membrane? So the question is, do any virions package ATP or other energetic molecules? That's a highly controversial question, <laughs> um, whether they in fact do or not. Um, certainly, once they're inside the cytoplasm, they don't seem to. <clears throat> um, they wouldn't need to because they're going to have some of that there already. Uh, there is considerable discussion, actually, interestingly enough, on, on HIV, is how much is actually packaged inside the HIV virion. 
and whether some of the reverse transcription can actually take place um, in an extracellular form, um, that's rather controversial, um, whether that happens or not. Yeah? For the adenovirus and the herpes virus, it looks like there's a some sort of pore on the capsid that opens up to deliver uh, into the nucleus. Do, do they always have a pore, or do they just like disassociate entirely into pieces? So, as usual, my standard answer is both. yes, <laughs> um, both. Turns out that um, the herpes viruses actually have very specific pore structures. And adenovirus seems mostly just associate. Okay, bacteria. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have seen the T4 entry video. Probably ad nauseum um, by now. Probably is not going to work, but we'll try it anyway. Um, but the big problem with bacteria, and also true for plants that we talked about last time, is actually getting inside the cell is really hard. Um, because bacteria are usually floating around as single-celled organisms, so they've got to protect themselves from the environment. And so it's very difficult for the virus to get its genome inside the host. And we'll see whether um, Vimeo, is Vimeo, do you know if that's, um, oh yes, so this is actually going to work too. So um, this is <clears throat> now from Michael Rossman's lab, same group that also did the Zika virus structure. Uh, <clears throat> where they look at a nice animation of bacteriophage T4. Here's bacteriophage T4. These poor unsuspecting E. coli in the background here. Um, you'll notice that this um, head structure is an elongated icosahedron um, and then has this helical tail structure, binds to the receptors on the surface of the cell, it's that binding that causes this conformational change. And then once you have secondary binding, then you have contraction of this really syringe-like structure to get through the first membrane, then enzymes which dissolve that second membrane, and then the genome is released on the inside. Um, I first saw this video at a conference probably you know, almost 15 years ago now. Um, we were all blown away, and then the guy who's the first author on the paper said, actually, they got it wrong, um, because the helical symmetry here is actually opposite, so it should be the other way around. So, yes. How many? How many? Actually, probably there are only about people who've taken my class, uh, and other than that, like 15 or 20 people in the world who know that that's the problem with this video. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah? I was going to say, just kind of speaking on phylogeny, is there mm -hmm. any sort of, like, knowledge between, like, the viral syringe that, syringe that you see there and, like, the kind of syringe that you see? Really yeah, in terms so the question here is are there similarities between this phage contraction and syringes or some of the <clears throat> um, usually people think about type 6 pili or various different pili for putting your um, and usually it's in terms of the bacteria interacting with the eukaryotic cells in terms of releasing their um, toxins or whatever it is. Uh, there's a lot of arguments about whether which came first, the chicken or the egg or the phage or the bacteria in this case. Um, I'm, of course, on one camp, as you can probably guess. Um, but there are some really interesting similarities between the two. And in fact, there's a nice study that I, I'll try and get a reference for um, looking at how some of these genomes that have gotten incorporated inside the host actually encode these tail-like structures. Um, and those are clearly viral, um, which are important for um, interactions with, with their various different hosts. I'll try and get that, get that paper and post it. So yeah, it's a, a very interesting question, um, and no one has a really good handle on it. Oops. <clears throat> so I just wanted to finish up today. We're probably not going to get to, I didn't think we would, um, the single-stranded RNA phage. Um, talk a little bit about some antiviral <clears throat> therapies which block this particular entry step. And so, unfortunately, again, the HIV video that didn't work um, talked about a specific peptide that was designed, in fact, to block the conformational change that has to happen to get membrane fusion um, to take place. Uh, an obvious way to also block something, an infection, is just block binding. And so blocking the binding of the virion to the actual receptor um, is a really good way to get this to work. And it turns out that this is exactly how vaccines work, because 
the vaccines are actually binding to the receptor binding protein for the most part. That's the whole point of the antibody response. Um, so there also are people who've tried to flood the whole system with receptors that are not associated with cells, basically trying to trick the virus into binding to something which is actually not a cell. Um, none of that's worked yet, um, but it seems to be a, a particularly promising way of looking at things. Um, once you've actually had the binding to the cell, you have to either have membrane fusion or uncoat your nucleocapsid. Um, these have actually been quite <clears throat> successful. Um, these are, in fact, some currently in the clinic, although unfortunately most of these M2 channel inhibitors, we'll talk much more about that when we talk about influenza, um, are now, the, has been used so much that the most of the circulating viruses are actually resistant to these particular things. Um, rhinovirus uncoating and um, picornavirus uncoating. Let's take a look at some of these examples. Um, here's the <clears throat> M2 pore. I mentioned some of the changes that happen in pH. Um, turns out the internal pH of influenza virus has to change once it's inside the endosome. The way that happens is through this pore structure, and this molecule happens to block that pore, so you don't get a change in pH, you don't get the change in structure. Um, that's where that is. Uh, <clears throat> poliovirus also has to have a conformational change in order to release its genome. Um, here is that particular drug. It's a little bit hard to see here. Um, the arrow right here representing where that um, drug is binding to the structure of this capsid protein, again, that has to undergo a conformational change in order to release the virus genome. So um, it, this, this whole sort of Achilles heel um, process, it's sort of the idea of a lot of these antivirals is to block that virus-specific step of getting inside the cell. Uh, you can also do much more general processes. Um, now, the obvious one, okay, how does the virus know that it's inside an endosome? Because the pH is changing. Well, if you change that and block the acidification of the endosome, then you can block that change that's going to happen in the virion. Unfortunately, that process is also going to mess up all of the other endosome-mediated processes that are going on inside the cell. So it's not a really very specific process. Um, but if people are highly immune compromised um, and they're in conditions where there could be some nasty virus infections, this is, is certainly being used in the clinic. Um, most of you have probably heard about Tamiflu. Yes. Um, Tamiflubicue from the onion. We'll talk more about that later. But <laughs> So um, Tamiflu is an inhibitor of, <clears throat> in fact, virus, sort of more virus release processes. So the neuraminidase is sort of the opposite process that happens in influenza to the hemagglutinin. Hemagglutinin will, hemagglutinin and uh, agglutinates red blood cells. Neuraminidase actually will chop that off and then allow the red blood cells to separate. That's how they're originally found. But what that seems to do is the neuraminidase actually seems to stop virus clumping. And so the neuraminidase would be causing the viruses to clump next to each other if you block that, which is actually kind of amazing that it even works, that you can use a neuraminidase inhibitor and that in itself will block the spread of influenza, but it's not actually doing anything in terms of getting in. So this is a nice example of that. Um, Oseltamivir is the other name, or one of the multiple other names for Tamiflu. Um, here it is, um, small molecule binding to the neuraminidase um, enzyme here um, around the outside. So that's all I have to talk about in terms of entry. Are we all happy with entry? Happy enough to answer a clicker question? Of course, yes. So <clears throat> most common Cellular mechanism used for animal virion entry into host cells is phagocytosis, pinocytosis, endocytosis, hepaglutination, or pore formation. Can you read as fast as I can talk? 
on that super duper study slide, I noted those tegument proteins. Mm -hmm. Are we going to be talking about those, or should I look into myself? We talk about herpes. Okay, great, great. great. And uh, that waiting for mitosis mm -hmm. is, is, is that being used as a, a viral oncology strategy? Not that I know. Huh. It just seems Although like a some obvious. Kind of, yeah, if you can yeah. if you can target somehow something yeah. which is actually dividing, yeah, yeah. Get so the furiously dividing cells. Huh. I think some of the herpes virus based oncolytic therapy might okay. use that, but I wouldn't know off the top sure. of my head. Okay, thanks. Pardon? Oh, yeah, that's. We'll talk more about that later. There's actually some really interesting antiviral and anti-antiviral mechanisms. <laughs> so, <clears throat> ah, 98%. So close. So close indeed. So yes, it is C. Um, hallelujah. Okay, we're not quite done yet, um, but. <clears throat> We're, we will. We won't get into the RNA virus. Um, <clears throat> let's say the RNA virus processes. But just wanted to finish up with the last two slides. Um, this is how to get out of the cell, and um, we've already talked about this a little bit already. Um, lysis is sort of the obvious way to get your virions outside of the cell. It's sort of the classic process. Uh, it's from the point of view of a virus, it's dependent on its host. Um, lysis might not be the best way to be replicating because you're killing off your host usually in that process. Um, but this is very common for the non-enveloped viruses because it's kind of a little hard to imagine how you can get a non-enveloped virus actually back outside of the cell without killing it. Uh, and there are lots of different ways that this happens. And again, we'll talk more about this when we talk about the individual ones later on. Um, but very often there's a specific lysis protein which is made very late on Late, excuse me, late in the infection process. Um, and in some cases, it's literally a hole. And people actually call these hole-in proteins that will make a hole in the membrane of this particular cell and be released. Of course, um, timing is absolutely critical for this because if you make this protein too soon, you make a hole and your virion's not done. And the cell dies and you don't have any extra virions. So um, it's a <clears throat> very well-regulated process in terms of actually looking at these kinds of things. Probably much more common um, would be budding here. Um, as my ex-graduate student used to call this exfiltration. I'm not quite sure why he called it exfiltration. I have called it budding. Uh, the easy way of thinking about this is envelope viruses because an envelope virus um, is picking up the membrane as it goes out and then all of the viral membrane proteins that are associated with it um, timing is nowhere near as critical um, in terms of this because you're not making a big hole inside the cell. Um, the only thing is that you have to then be budding in the right place in the cellular membrane because all of these envelope viruses have virus glycoproteins that are sticking in the virus envelope. Well, if you're going to be budding, you better be sure that you're budding your genome where you've got all of these virus envelope proteins. So assembling those in the right place um, is really, really important. And then the last one that we will talk about a lot more later on, VAPs. Who knows what VAPs stand for? <laughs> so, um, these are virion-associated pyramids. And this is something that was discovered by one of my colleagues, again, about five years ago. Um, these are literally pyramidal structures that form in the membrane of infected cells that open up like flowers, and then that's how the virus is released. I think one of the coolest processes in terms of virus release that's been discovered to date. Um, this is just a summary of what we've talked about so far. We'll talk about bacteriophage finally on Friday, but one real quick question before everybody runs away. Do viruses ever shut down the replication? Do viruses ever shut down replication? The answer is, Yes. <laughs> and we'll, we'll talk much more about that for the individual ones.